Oh God, our Father, we do continue to come to you this morning, offering you our heart. God, this morning we want all that we know about ourselves just to be surrendered up and offered to all that we know about you. God, thank you for giving us this opportunity to worship you, to praise you, to lift your name on high because you are worthy, you are glorious, you are the King of kings. And we want you to be the Lord of our life, the Lord of our heart, because you are Lord. God, as we think back on this past year, 2023, we're reminded of times maybe when we drifted away from you, when our heart was not focused on you, when our heart was divided. And God, I thank you for the promise that you've given us in your word that if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And God, that's what we desperately want this morning. We want our heart to be reunited with you, to be totally merged with you. We want our lives to be open to you, to change us, to be more like you. And we want what we do in this hour to truly be lifting up your name and worshiping you. And as we look forward to the future, as we look forward into this coming year, 2024, God, I pray that this will be a year when we are totally undivided in our heart, our mind, our attitude, our love for you because of your love for us, because of your faithfulness to us. And right now for today, God, here we are. We're here to worship you with an undivided heart. We thank you that we've been able to sing about how faithful you are and to sing about how much we love you, how much we need that undivided heart to take us away from the cares of this world. And allow you to walk with us in those cares. And so God, right now, as we open your word, as we continue to worship you through the written word of God, I pray that the Holy Spirit will take your word and apply it to our life. And God, how I pray that you will change us today into having a totally undivided heart towards you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. and couple of things. If you're here today and you're one of our children, if you want to worship God with our children in your uh, environment in the Children's Worship Center, feel free to take off right now. And for the rest of us, I want to invite you to open your Bible with me uh, to the book of Esther. Uh, Esther is almost right in the middle of your Bible. If you go to Psalms, which is right in the middle of the Bible, and turn back a, a couple of little books, you have Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and then Job and Psalms. And so you'll find Esther almost right in the center of uh, the Bible. So open with me there. Let me just say as we begin this morning, uh, there are going to be some names that sound strange as I read the scripture this morning. And if you hear this morning, if you have a new international translation of the Bible... Uh, the name for the king that we're going to be talking about in New International Translation is the Persian name Xerxes. But in our uh, English Standard Version, the version that we use here, uh, we use the Hebrew term, which is the Hasherah. So uh, the same person. Uh, if you look in history books, you're probably going to see Xerxes. But Hasherah is the same person as Xerxes. So having said that, your Bible's open to Esther chapter 1. I'm going to read the entire chapter, so follow along with me uh, as we read together Ezra chapter 1. I'll read aloud and you follow along silently, beginning with verse 1. Uh, Esther, I may have said Ezra, I meant Esther chapter 1. Now in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned in India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces, in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media 
and nobles and governors of the provinces were before him, while he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and the pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days. And when these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in Susa the citadel, both great and small, a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white cotton curtains and violet hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rods and marble pillars, and also couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Drinks were served in golden vessels, vessels of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king, and drinking was according to this edict. There is no compulsion, for the king had given orders to all the staff of his palace to do as each man desired. Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women in the palace that belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mahuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abagatha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. At this, the king became enraged and his anger burned within him. Then the king said to the wise men who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in law and judgment, the men next to him being Karshima, Sethar, Admetha, Tarshish, Merez, Marcina, and Mamukan, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who saw the king, king's face and sat first in the kingdom. According to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti because she has not performed the command of King Ahasuerus delivered by the eunuchs? Then Mamukin said in the presence of the king and the officials, Not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the peoples who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble women of Persia and Media who have heard of the queen's behavior will say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath in plenty. If it please the king, let a royal order go out for him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it may not be repealed, that Vashti is never again to come before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, for it is vast, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. This advice pleased the king and the princes, and the king did as Mimucan proposed. And he sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in its own script, and to every people in its own language, and to every man, that every man be master in his own household and speak according to the language of his people. This is the word of the Lord. So according to a fascinating website that I ran across this week that shows the current world population, worldometers.info, there are 8 point billion stories being lived out in our world today. 8.1 billion people. 8.1 billion stories being written. Every day, babies are born. Yesterday, I was in a meeting with a friend of mine, Robert Shaw, and his son, Robbie, just had a brand new baby born this week. Every day, babies are born. Every day, 
people die. My friend Donald King called me yesterday and said that his mother-in-law, or his father-in-law, had died yesterday. Every day people are born. Every day people die. Those are kind of common events in, in every one story. You were born. You're here. You're part of that story. But the greater story is what happens between the time you're born and the time you die. The greater story is what happens to every person from the time they're born to the time they die. The 8.1 billion stories being lived out today are all important. You are important. Your story is important. And that's part of the bigger story. The bigger story of creation, the fall of man, God's rescue plan, and God's restoration plan is a part of the story of this world. It's a part of your story. It's a part of life. Every breath you take is a gift from God. What you do with that life is your story. And your story can be an awesome gift back to God. As we move through Esther over these next nine or ten weeks, that's going to be our goal, to help you see where you fit into God's big story. How your life story can be a great gift in the bigger chapter, the greater chapter of, of God's story. And for this morning, Esther is one of those examples of how these two stories work, the story of man and the story of God, and how these two stories merge together for the human story to become part of God's greater story. The book of Esther is a story of why we should trust God even when we can't see Him working. That may be your journey today. You may be going through some struggles in your life today and you may be wondering, where's God in the middle of all this? But no matter how challenging things get in a person's story, no matter how hard and difficult things get, or even how horrible things get in a person's story, the story of God is a story of redemption. There is good news and even your most disastrous story today. And we're going to see that fleshed out in the life and the story of Queen Esther. God is here today to instill hope into your story. And you may know somebody who's struggling. Maybe you're here today so you can be God's agent, God's conduit. To bring hope, bring the hope of God into that person's story as well. God wants you to know today, and He wants everybody to know that He loves you. He cares about you. And your story can be filled with that overriding hope and confidence, even in the midst of your greatest problems, your greatest difficulty. And your story can be filled with knowing that God is greater than any challenge you face. If, as we look at the, as the book of Esther, the name of God is not mentioned in the book of Esther. There are only a couple of books in the Bible where God's name is not even mentioned, and this is, this is one of them. But one of the reasons we have the book of Esther in the Bible is to show that the hiddenness of God is not the absence of God. The hiddenness of God is not the absence of God. Our children this morning in our children's worship center are going to be learning about that reality, that the, the hiddenness of God is, is not the same as the absence of God. We're going to see in these ten chapters that God sovereignly and mercifully preserves His people in the midst of disaster, in the midst of adversity in the midst of challenges. And you're going to see that that's your story today as well. Each of these themes that we're going to look at today have been prevalent over the history of mankind. Three of these themes are the themes of the human story. 
And then there are two other themes that we're going to look at that are a part of the greater story. How this story is so relevant to my life and your life today. The name Esther literally means morning star. Morning star. Rabbi Lewis Ginsburg said this. He said, and I quote, The deeds of Queen Esther cast a ray of light forward into Israel's history from a dark time. And this was one of the darkest times. For almost a hundred years, these people who Esther was a part of, the Israelites, had been in exile, had been taken away from their homeland in Israel. And we're going to see next week that their identity was almost at the point of being totally wiped out. And that's where God uses Esther and raises her up on the scene. So let's unpack these themes and see these five themes that we want to apply to our life today so personally and so relevantly. First of all, Let's look at the story of worldly luxury. We see that in verses 1 through 9. I hope as I read through the passage, you got sort of a taste, sort of a hint of the, the luxury of this king and queen and his court. Uh, Ahasuerus had succeeded his father in ruling this Persian empire from 486 B.C. to 465 B.C. Those were the years of his reign. And in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1 of Esther, The text tells us that this one man ruled 127 provinces stretching from Pakistan to northern Sudan. Today, that would include, listen to this now, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, Jordan, Lebanon, Israel, Egypt, Libya, Arabia, and the Sudan. I mean, we can't even imagine the massive square footage, square miles that this one king reigned over. And he was the supreme authority who sat on the throne, the Bible says. I think the writer of Scripture wants to give us this picture of this dominating man sitting on his throne over and above half of the world, the known world of, of, of that time. He was the most powerful man in the world. And in his supreme authority, as he sat on his throne, in his heart, he was the king of the world. Nobody would tell him what he had to do. He had it all in his mind. Anytime, anywhere, anything that he wanted, it was his. He was that powerful. So what did he do? Well, to display his power in verses 3 and 4, we see that because of his wealth, because of his power, (laughs) he threw this gigantic party. This party lasted for half of a year, 180 days, the Bible says. Imagine having that kind of atmosphere, that kind of uh, temperature in the land with a party going on for 180 days, for half a year. But that wasn't all. After that 180 days to flaunt his glory and splendor, he gave another party for seven days for all of his officials in the capital city where he loved to spend his summers, the citadel of Susa. In verses 5 through 8, we see where he gave this banquet. And again, the focus of this party, the focus of this banquet, was to call all men in the citadel, listen to this, to drink as much as they want any time they wanted it. Can you imagine the atmosphere that must have been going on around this crazy situation? Table decorations and servings are described here to display the luxury that only a king like this could afford. Flaunting this wealth and flaunting this luxury, though, revealed his character. It it brought out for all to see who he really was in his heart. I know it's difficult as you sit here this morning and say, How what does that have to do with me? How can I relate to that? Well, I'll look around this room, and as I look around our region, 
even our country. All of us on a world standard are very rich, very wealthy. You may say, what? Uh, we spent some time this summer in Zambia, in Africa. And I saw what poverty really looks like. Yesterday I was in a meeting with a missionary who's serving in Kenya. And his whole ministry is built around a trash dump. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of people who live around that trash dump, and they take the trash that people who we would probably consider to be poor bring to the trash dump, and they either eat their food from that trash dump, or they take the trash that people bring and try to find somebody outside to purchase it, to buy it, so that they can have a penny or two to buy some food. On a world standard, you're wealthy. You're rich. What are you doing with what you have? How is what you have representative of your heart? Are you thinking only about yourself? The circle around you, your family, your future? Are you thinking outside the box to how God might could be involved in your story of what you actually have? Well, Ahasuerus <laughs> was unbelievably wealthy. Um, he had a motive, and his motive was to solidify the people in this massive kingdom to be a part of his bigger plan for life to take over Greece or whatever, the Greek world, the Greek empire. But in his heart, this, this one event that we're going to look at today exposed who he was. He craved the respect of leaders of, of, of the conquered regions around him, and he wanted them to admire him. He wanted them, again, to look at him as the king of the world. And he never expected the story of his wife to conflict with his story. And so there's a, th there's a third event that goes on we see in verse 9. In verse 9, Queen Vashti also threw a feast for the women of the royal palace in Citadel. So we have these, these, these three banquets that go on. Banquet one, 180 days. Banquet two, seven days for the, the, the nobles and all the men of the citadel and Susa. And then a third banquet that Vashti gave for the women of Susa. But here's the deal. Wealth will never be the answer to the biggest problem in the life of a king and queen or anyone else. It's not what you have that counts. It never is. No story will ever be completed through worldly luxury, through what you have, through even your comfort. The story of depending on worldly luxury to provide contentment is hopeless. That's what I want you to remember today. It's, it's hopeless. I know many people in our Grand Strand region, in our community, who are literally spoiled by luxury. They're not living in reality. And what's going to happen when they come to that dot at the end of birth? The other common element that all of us have, death. It's hopeless. God used the fabric of the story of Ahasuerus, though, to weave his much bigger story. Although worldly luxury does not resolve man's greatest need, there is hope, there is an answer to man's greatest need. Power and wealth is not the answer. Relationships, meaningful relationships and vibrant marriages, for example, must be built on a mutual relationship that goes much deeper than luxury, much deeper than what you have as far as wealth is concerned. So how are you building sacrificial love and respect into the relationships that you have? Serving each other. 
and sacrificing for one another are much bigger and much more important values than simply living for our human wealth and human luxury and human comfort. So that's the first nine verses. The story of human wealth. Human luxury. Second one. The second theme that we see unraveled here in verses 10 through 15 is the story of human folly. Story of human folly. On the seventh day of this feast, the king was stone drunk. The Bible says he was out of his mind drunk. And he commanded his eunuchs to bring Queen Vashti before him wearing nothing but a crown so that he could flaunt her superiority and her beauty to the world around him. And she threw a curveball into the culture and to the drunken masculine pride of his day. Verse 12, look at it. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. And at this, the king became enraged and his anger burned within him. Vashti's story threatened the power and the foolish heart of this powerful king. When the queen refused to come and the king had requested that she display herself before his audience, his folly led to a drunken rage. And her story drastically interfered with what he wanted his story to look like. Rather than look like the king of the world, <laughs> he was in jeopardy of looking like a wimp before all the world or his world. Do, do you see how the, the, the picture that's painted here is the story of our world as well? Here's how it relates. When, when two stories collide, when your story collides with, with my story in this world, one doesn't get their way. Explosions happen. People get depressed. People get angry. People get resentful. People get hostile. So the next time you feel repressed or depressed or angry or resentful or even hostile, look deep within and ask God to help identify the cause of your emotions. Why am I feeling this way? Am I truly in the right place with my attitude toward God? It's where I'm listening to what He's saying to me rather than listening to what my emotions are saying to me. For one thing, Ahasuerus was drunk. Now, there's a big caution about that, drinking too much. And I don't want to go down that road this morning, but that, that's real. That's in this story. And we have to pay attention to that. When you put drugs and alcohol in your body, you do crazy things. But there's a much bigger story going on here. If the, if the cause of the collision that you have with another person, you're facing disaster in that relationship, look at what the issue really is, not the emotion that you feel. Look at verse 14 and see where Hashirah has turned. In his folly and anger, he turned to worldly wise men for advice. <laughs> now, these, these men, the Bible says, were the closest men that he had in his life. They knew the current culture. They were versed in the law and in judgment. And a principle here is be careful who you listen to. Be careful who you surround yourself with. Because who you listen to will shape who you become. That's why it's so important to the best of your ability to plug your life into a small group of other believers who have a common faith that you do. So you can help each other know what God's will is, what God's wisdom is. It's so important that you plug yourself into a church like this. And become a member of a church like this where you stake your life, stake your spiritual growth in a church like this. It's terribly important. Be careful who you surround yourself with. 
Uh, some of you are, have been reading this past year and continuing this year, reading a chapter a day through the Bible. Last year, a few months ago, we read about uh, the transition between King David. When he died, he passed the throne on to King Solomon. And the first half of Solomon's years were great years, godly years. The last half were disastrous for him. But then when he passed his king's throne on to his son, Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the very first thing he did in his reign was ask advice. He asked advice from older, wise men. They gave him advice. He asked advice for younger men who had run around with him. What advice do you think he took? He took the younger men's advice and paid the price for it. The kingdom of Israel divided at that point, never to be truly reunited again. I heard about this man one time. This dad told his son, don't go to the doctor when you just have one thing wrong with you. Wait until you have four or five. You'll get more bang for your buck. <laughs> what kind of wisdom is that? Be careful who you listen to. You could die waiting on the next four or five things to happen in your life. I was coming out to work earlier this week. It was cold that morning and it was dark still, and I was coming up 21st Avenue. I saw the big sign in front of the convention center. And it said, 71 degrees. <laughs> I looked at my dash of the monitor, and it was 31 degrees. What do you think the convention center wants the world to know? They want the world to come to the beach. And so they had 71 degrees up there instead of 31 degrees. Seriously, be careful who you listen to. So in his human folly, Ahasuerus turned to his only hope. His only source of hope was the friends he had around him. But he never knew that God was using these worldly wise men to set the stage for God's greater purpose. They suffered because of it. But God's hand was still in that move. Just like Pharaoh and all the other godless leaders in history. Ahasuerus had no idea that he was a chapter in God's greater story. And you're going to see as we move through this book, you're going to have that choice too. You can choose to be part of God's bigger story. Or you can stiff arm God and go in another direction. And it's going to be disastrous for you as well. Worldly wisdom, quickly is centered around self, self-confidence, self-esteem, self-worth. It says that you have to look good in all circumstances, no matter what, you've got to look good. You've got to be the, the king and queen of the show. The focus is on individual rights, personal comfort, personal pride. You draw a circle around yourself and all the world revolves around you. That's, that's worldly wisdom. That's what the world says. But Ahasuerus had nowhere else to turn. And in his folly, he appealed to the law and the judgment of his worldly advisors. However, the sovereignty of God is greater than the story of human folly. You can choose to run off in your own direction if you want to. It's a high price to pay, and you don't want to pay that price. So what are some hard places you're facing in your life today. Some people may be facing a hard time with finances. Some may be facing a hard time with relationships. Some may be facing a hard time with the consequences of bad choices of 2023 that are carrying over to 2024, and you've got to face the bad consequences to the bad choices we made. Some may be facing health issues. Some may be facing uncontrolled emotions that, that we may have. Always remember this. God is working even when we can't see Him. And every challenge, every problem, every struggle that you have is either driving you to God and you can run to Him, or the temptation is to run away from God and forget that He's even there in your story. 
And that leads us to the third theme that's revealed in verses 16 to 22. And that's the story of human pride. Human pride. Mamukin was an advisor to the king. And not only did the king's story tell us something about the king's heart, Mamukin's story tells us a lot about his heart as well. Look at how his story focused on his pride and comfort and selfishness and wanting to be dominant authority over his household. Verse 17, he said that the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt. Since they will say, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vesta to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble women of Persia and Media will have heard of queen, queen, the queen's behavior and will say the same to all the king's officials. And there will be contempt and wrath aplenty. <laughs> Look at the perspective that he's having. He's, he's thinking about himself. He was one of those royal leaders in the king's court. First of all, he exaggerated the situation. He claimed that the entire order of the world would be changed in one day if Queen Vashti gets away with this. We can't have that. Mamukin was thinking about himself. And that will always get us in trouble when we think first about ourselves, rather than looking vertically at, at, at God's perspective of what's going on in our life. The story of human pride says, me first. He thought, don't let anything happen that's going to affect my position or my pleasure or my possessions or, or my comfort. That's the problem with human pride. It's all about self. It's all about me. So look at verse 19 as he continues. If it please the king... Let a royal order go out from him to be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it may not be repealed that Vashti is never again to come before King Ahasuerus. And let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. Wow. Imagine how God took this bad idea from an ungodly leader and turned it into a plan to save the whole country of Israel, the whole nation. That's the way God works. Bad things can come from bad leaders that God uses to produce something that's very good. He says in verse 20, so when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, for it is vast. All women will give honor to their husbands. All women, my wife, <laughs> will give honor to me, to their husbands, high and low alike. See, the best the world has to offer in writing your story is self-centered. It's about you. What a boatload of worldly advice. Mamukin gave to the king. He was only thinking about himself. Oh, church, don't fall into that trap of just thinking about yourself. It's a terrible trap to fall into. I'm so thankful for Christianity, for all thousands of reasons, but I'm very thankful for Christianity because in Christianity, men and women in marriage and family roles are taught to treat each other with respect, to treat each other with dignity. And the Bible teaches that husbands are to love their wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. True marriages, as far as that goes, true relationship is always bigger than one individual. It's about mutual love, mutual respect, mutual dignity among partners in relationship and especially in marriage. Years ago, my, my mother called me. She was in distress. She 
had a very good friend. Her very best friend was her pastor's wife. And here's what my mother said. My mother said, my best friend called me today and said that her husband came home driving a U-Haul truck and said, pack up, we're leaving, we're moving to another city without even having any conversation or discussion or prayer with her. That's no way to have a Christian marriage or to have a Christian relationship. But Mamukin only had his own best interest in mind, and so he gave the king this worldly foolish advice. Look at verse 21. This advice pleased the king and the princes, and the king did as Mamukin proposed. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in its own script, and to every people in its own language, that every man be master of his own household and speak according to the language of his people. The story of human pride is hopeless. It's hopeless. There's no, there's no value in it for eternity. But as always, God used the foolishness of worldly wisdom for his sovereign purpose. So let's turn now away from the human story. And let's look very briefly, very quickly at two aspects of the greater story. There's a fourth theme revealed in this book, and that's the story of God. Story of God. The story of God is the story about creation, the fall, the rescue, the restoration plan that the Bible is really all about, that God has in human history. See, before anything existed in this world, God existed. He's pre-existent to the world. He always has been. He always will be. That's what makes him God. That's one of the things that makes him God. He, he predates history. He created this world. He created you. And so in his sovereignty, he has a right to control everything that happens in this world. Remember this. You say, why is this happening in my life? We've all probably had that thought if we've not said it out loud. But here's the reality. Everything that happens in this world, before, now, in the future, everything that happens in this world, God either allows it or he causes it to happen. Plug that theology and that reality into your life system. The question to ask is, where is God in the middle of my story? Where is God in the middle of the disaster, the crisis that even I've caused myself? God's in it if you'll look for Him. He sovereignly wants to lead you through the journey that you're going through in your life today. Because nothing happens outside of God's authority. And as the story of Esther unfolds, we're going to see that God's presence is everywhere, even when His voice is silent. That's true for you and me as well. You may be going through some challenging things today, right now. You may wonder if God is there, if God even cares. He does. He is. He loves you. He cares about you. I said this before, but let me say it again. Pain can either draw you to God, or pain can be used to push you away from God. Let it pull you to God today. In your distress, in your pain, turn to God. And let your story merge with His story. Let His story be part of your story. And that leads me to the final thought for today. And that's the story of hope. Story of hope. Your story is a story of hope when your story intersects with God's story. Remember, you were born and you're going to die. Your story is what really happens in between when you're born and when you die. The story of worldly luxury and human anger and folly and human pride so forth, it all leads to hopelessness. But when you let your story merge with God's story, you let Him 
guide you through the distress and pain and journey and victory. Whatever you experience in life, you, you walk through it with Him. There's hope. There's great hope. The disaster story of Vashti opened the door, as the Bible tells us, for Queen Esther to come on the scene. And so, even in her environment, the absence of God was not the silence. The silence of God was never the absence of God. Let me say that again. The, the silence of God was never the absence of God. You can put your faith and trust in God today and let Him bring hope into your life. In Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Hope, Here's what he says. Hope is the inextinguishable flicker God ignites in our souls to keep believing in the prevailing power of His light even when we are surrounded by utter darkness. In other words, God is there when we can't see Him. Strobel goes on and says, Hope is the quiet resolve God hardwires into our spirit that clings to the seemingly impossible truth that in all things... God works for good of those who love Him. And that in the grand scheme of things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. That's why we read that passage earlier today. There's hope when we merge our story with God's story. That's the story of Esther, and that's the story of you and me. Esther kept the greater story of Jesus alive by risking her life for her nation. And then that same solution, Jesus, came into the world through the Israeli nation and made it possible for you and me to merge our story with God's story. Remember, the hiddenness of God is not the absence of God. The story of redemption is clear. God used the foolishness of sinful men to preserve His chosen people. They had found themselves in a hopeless situation. But God came on the scene and provided hope in that nation, and today He provides hope for those who will put our trust and faith in Him. God wants His story of love and redemption to be your story. I stand here before you today for no logical reason on planet Earth for me being here. I was born in South Alabama, five foot nine inches tall, weighed 135 pounds when I graduated from high school. And God opened the door for me to come to Furman University on a football scholarship. Look, football scholarship, 135 pounds soaking wet. That's what brought me here. It, it was God's sovereignty that brought me here. Many joys came out of that experience. In the last 20 years or so, I've had some real devastating experiences. You're here today, and I'm here today, because of what the world would say was a devastating experience. No explanation for it. And out of that disastrous experience, God birthed Palmetto Shores Church. And you're here today to hear the message of God clearly presented. That if you admit that you're a sinner, and you're willing to repent of your sin and turn away from it, repent and turn away, and turn your life totally to that Jesus that you believe in to pay the price for the penalty of your sin, He shed His blood to pay for your sin. It's a gift that He offers you. And because of the sacrifice of Esther and her risking her life to maintain a nation that brought Jesus into the world, and then Jesus coming into this world to live and die, live a perfect life and pay the price for your sin, you today can give your life to Jesus, accept His salvation, and then spend the rest of your life praising Him and giving glory to Him and letting God use the story of your life 
to share with your family and your friends and those that God puts in front of you to share the gospel with. That's the good news of Esther. And I pray that you'll be able to be part as we unpack this over the next nine chapters and unpack the rest of this story. But for today, please let God's story intersect with your story so that your story can give praise and glory to the God story. God, I thank you today for the way you do work sovereignly to even take the sin of our life, the bad choices of our life, and call us to repentance from that because of what you have done And call us to turn away from that sin as we repent of it. And never repeat it again. But let the story of our life, of your forgiveness and your love, and the story of our repentance and turning away from that sin because of the blood of Jesus, let that story impact the story of people who are closest to us today. God, thank you for calling us into the greater story, into your story. And I look forward to this year. I look forward to this year being a year of repentance, a year of devotion, a year of service for you, only for your honor and your glory. And God, today, if there would be one here who would turn to you, I pray that would happen by your sovereign grace, that you would call them to repent of their sin and give their life to you. But I pray that all of us would be willing to put our lives in your hands to intersect our life with your life and let our life reflect your life. In Jesus' name now we continue to worship.